The parable of the Good Samaritan is perhaps one of the best known of all the stories that Jesus told. Just to recap, Jesus had just sent his disciples out on a mission and they had returned on a high and Jesus shared their joy and continued to say that he was particularly pleased that they had grasped what the wise and the intelligent had failed to see. I'm not sure how I would have felt if Jesus had paid me such a compliment. Well, we might think, it's a good job I'm a bit thick. Otherwise, I might have failed to see the point. But then someone from the crowd around them stands up in order to ask Jesus a question. Rabbi, teacher, he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Which is an odd question, after all. What can we do to inherit anything beyond weight and receive it as a gift. But Jesus clocks that this guy is a lawyer. It doesn't say how, maybe it's the briefcase and the shiny suit. And he says, well, what does the law say? And the lawyer says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbour as yourself. Now, this summary of the law comes from the Old Testament, from the books of Deuteronomy and Leviticus. But note this, it doesn't say don't do to others what you would not have them do to you. Most law limits the harm that we can do to others. Do not murder, do not steal and so on. But this law is about maximising the good that we can do. Love God, love your neighbour to the maximum. Love them with all that you are. But for the lawyer, this is a bit too open-ended. So he asks, well, who is my neighbour? You see, he's trying to limit things again. And that leads me to wonder what it is in us that limits the good that we do to others. And so I want to rattle through some answers to the question, what limits the good that we do? <clears throat> the first thing is probably an emphasis on law rather than grace. The priest in the story Jesus told was on his way down the mountain from Jerusalem to Jericho. Many of the priests in first century lived in Jericho. They would go up to Jerusalem for a two-week assignment and then return to their homes in Jericho. This priest fits easily into such a pattern and may well have been on his way home from the sacred precincts of the temple where he will have been carrying out his temple duties. Now, priests were members of a hereditary guild, and they were well known to be quite wealthy. As a person of means, the priest would not be hiking 17 miles down the hill when he could easily afford a ride. A Middle Easterner listening to the story would assume that the priest was riding, in the same way that if I said that uh, I will be heading to London from Colchester, you would not assume that I would be walking there. So this priest had all the resources he needed at his disposal. It would have been so easy for him to have offered the injured man a ride. But instead, he just carried on passing by on the other side. Why? Well, in those days, it was you, only your duty to help people like yourself. But the priest had a special problem. The wounded man beside the road was unconscious and stripped. He could not speak, so you could not tell what language he spoke, and he was wearing no clothes. The two key ways of identifying him were no help in this situation. No doubt the priest wanted to do his duty under the law. But what was his duty? The same question dogs the Levite who came along next. This particular Levite probably knew that the priest was ahead of him on the road and may have indeed been an assistant to that same priest. Since the priest had set such an obvious precedent, the Levite could also pass by with an easy conscience. After all, a mere Levite could not upstage a priest. Did the Levite think that he understood the law better than the priest? And the Levite might have to face the same priest in Jericho that night. 
Could the Levite ride into Jericho with a wounded man whom the priest, in obedience to his understanding of the law, had adopted uh, had opted to ignore? Such an act would be an insult to the priest. It would offend the laws of decency, so the Levite carried on. If we approach situations from a sense of law, then we will always limit the amount of good that we are able to do to others and the amount of good that we can receive. A few years ago saw the release of a film version of Wonder Woman, which tells the story of Diana, who learns about the ongoing First World War and leaves her island home in order to end the conflict. In the climactic battle between Diana and Ares, the god of war, Ares tries to persuade Diana that the human race is evil and therefore undeserving of her protection. She responds saying, it's not about deserve, it's about what you believe and I believe in love. And then she adds, and I know that only love can truly change the world. In a film industry that usually operates according to a kind of karmic philosophy that you get what you deserve, and often portrays revenge in a positive light, Wonder Woman makes a significant departure. Diana's assertion that it's not about deserve is also the perfect definition of grace. Whether it is the paralysed man whose sins are forgiven, or the all ten lepers who were healed, or lonely old Zacchaeus who has to set another place at the table, Jesus appeared to be constantly giving and forgiving without any regard for merit or the laws of decency or fair play. As far as he was concerned, it was never about deserve. The Lutheran founder of House for All Sinners and Saints in Denver, Nadia Boltzweva, has developed what she calls Nadia's Field Guide for Spotting Law and Gospel, which offers a good way of distinguishing between the two. You can tell the law, she says, because it is almost always an if-then proposition. The law is always conditional. The gospel, Nadia says, is not an if-then proposition. It's more Wizard of Oz than that. The gospel is a because, 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 because proposition. The priest and the Levite saw everything in terms of an if then proposition. If this person is a fellow Jew, thinks the priest, then I can help him. If the priest passed by on the other side, thinks the Levite, then I cannot stop, for it would embarrass the priest. So law binds them and limits the good that they can do. But our response should be more Wizard of Oz than that. We stop to help because this is a fellow human being, because this is a person in need, because I love and care for people, because, 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 because. As the great Wonder Woman said, it's not about deserve. It's about what you believe, and I believe in love. And I know that only love can truly change the world. So on to the next thing that limits the good that we do, and that is purity. <clears throat> so back to the priest and what was whirring around in his mind. The wounded man could have been dead. If so, the priest who approached him would become ceremonially defiled, and if defiled, he would need to return to Jerusalem and undergo a week-long process of ceremonial purification. It would take some time to arrange such, such things, and meanwhile, he could not eat from the tithes or collect them, the same ban would apply to his family and his servants. Distribution to the poor would have also been impossible. And if the wounded man was alive and the priest touched him and the man later died of his wounds, then the priest would have been obliged to tear up his robes and in so doing would have violated the laws against the destruction of valuable property. And if the priest under the law became defiled, and still continued to operate as a priest, then the punishment was for his head to be smashed in. Defilement and impurity are serious issues in religion. In an excellent book by Richard Beck called Unclean, he says this, when the will to purity trumps the will to embrace, when sacrifice precedes mercy, the gears of socio-moral disgust begin to turn, poisoning the well of hospitality by activating the emotions of otherness. In the desire to secure purity, the faithful community will begin to turn inward. There is also always the sense of what Richard Beck calls the negative dominance. I don't know if it's ever struck you as odd 
that the Pharisees always assumed that the fact Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners must have made Jesus unclean by association. But they never once entertained the idea that Jesus could have had a purifying effect on the sinners, which of course he did and does. We, among all people, must be willing to get our hands dirty. That is what caring for others is all about. The final thing that limits the good that we do is busyness. I heard once of uh, some research undertaken in the United States. A group of college students were given the task of delivering a talk in five minutes time. And then the researchers placed a person in distress along the route to where they would deliver their talk. What percentage of the students do you think stopped? The answer is just 10%. The students were all seminarians and the talk they were asked to give was on the Good Samaritan. The experiment was repeated, but this time giving a different set of students 20 minutes before they were to deliver their talk. That time, 50% stopped. Perhaps one of the most troubling barriers to our neighbourliness and to the expression of our compassion is our busyness. I'm sure that the priest and the Levite were busy men, and maybe that contributed to their passing by on the other side. Now, before I close, I just want to say that if we're not careful, the story of the Good Samaritan becomes, becomes a kind of morality tale about random acts of kindness to strangers and nothing more. And I guess the other question that I have is who are we in this story? The Israelites who first heard the story were people whose ancestors had once been part of a great nation. They once had a great king called David, whose son Solomon built a magnificent temple. Israel in those days had never been so certain that God was on its side and that all was well with the world. But after Solomon, the kingdom split. In 720 BC, the northern kingdom was invaded and destroyed. And 130 years later, the southern kingdom was besieged, ransacked, and its ruling elite carted off to Babylon. God's people were in exile. And that's when so much of the Old Testament, the first part of the Bible, was put together. Books of history, poetry and song were woven together with words from the prophets that helped them to understand how they'd got themselves into this mess. But the prophets also spoke about hope and about the great things that God would do. And the amazing thing that they discovered is that God was closer to them in Babylon than they'd ever felt he was in the Promised Land. They discovered the truth that God meets us when we are in the gutter, that the gutter is where God is most at home. Now, at the time of Jesus, the temple had been rebuilt and the land was occupied, though, by the Roman army. So to some extent, people still felt that they were in exile. Israel was still in the gutter, stripped, beaten and as good as dead. And the core part of Jesus's message was that now is the time when God will redeem his people, bringing this time of exile to an end and inaugurating a new era of freedom and justice, an era that Israel could scarcely dream of in Babylon and had never experienced since. <clears throat> in so many ways, the story of the Good Samaritan is a story for those who feel stripped, beaten and as good as dead. It is for those who've lost so much, those who feel bruised and bewildered by the world. It is for those without hope. And Jesus knew that the beaten and the broken and the lost were not just those who, like the man, had been mugged. Actually, a lot of other people were feeling beaten and broken and lost. And Jesus told this story to them. And it is a story about how those people might be helped and healed and restored. The Samaritan in the story does all the things that Jesus does or is going to do. He 
comes to us. He has compassion for us. He helps us. He heals us. He carries us. He goes into the city for us. He brings us to a place of safety. He promises to return to complete the work of salvation that he has begun. If we just hear this story thinking that we are the Good Samaritan or that we should be the Good Samaritan, then we miss what it is about the gospel of Jesus Christ that this story is trying to tell us. Taking this line, the writer Sam Wells says this, The heart of the gospel is that when we were in the gutter, God lifted us up in Jesus and brought us home. When we were down and out and humiliated and rejected and foolish and failing and scorned and despised, Jesus touched us and heard us and forgave us and restored us and reconciled us and healed us and gave us life with him forever. The fundamental gospel is that we have failed to save ourselves and are incapable of saving ourselves and others, but that Jesus saves us anyway. So yes, Jesus is the Samaritan. Jesus is the one we despised and rejected and condemned and crucified. Jesus is the one who sets us on our feet again and binds up our wounds and bears us as his burden when we cannot carry our own loads. Jesus is the one who takes us to a place of greater safety and makes a home for us where we were strangers and promises to return when the time for reckoning is finally come. Jesus is the Good Samaritan. In the story Jesus told, the man in the gutter was able to receive help, healing and salvation from an unlikely source, and it was a making of him. And maybe that is where the story speaks to us today. For ultimately, the Christian life is not about us getting our act together. It's not about us doing our duty, keeping ourselves pure, or busying ourselves doing good. It is about us saying that we haven't got it all together, that we need help, healing, and salvation. It's about Jesus doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. It's about grace. It's about mercy. It's about love. That's why Jesus told this story. Yes, we know the virtue of doing good, of being the good Samaritan, offering companionship, seeking healing, working for restoration. But so much more importantly, this story is an invitation to allow Jesus to come to our aid, to heal us and to save us. Amen.